I'm continuing my teaching on excellence on our theme for the year and my message today is titled learning excellence through pressure sounds like a good title don't you think so learning excellence through pressure I have already talked about having both a hunger and an appetite for excellence and this week we're going to look at how pressure pressure enables us to be people of excellence people who break barriers people who do wonderful things for God and uh, we're going to start from Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 7 Proverbs chapter 27 verse number 7 <clears throat> And it says, a satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb, but to a hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. A satisfied soul loathes or hates the honeycomb, but to a hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. The honeycomb is naturally sweet. Uh, it is the, uh, the core of honey. And, and, and so it is naturally sweet. Sweeter actually more than the honey itself. Bitterness is not sweet. And many of you can think of uh, bitter things you have eaten or tasted in your life. Uh, sometimes it could be uh, a fruit that you thought was going to be sweet and uh, it wasn't sweet. It could be an unripe fruit, an unripe pineapple, an unripe mango, uh, uh, an unripe lemon. Lemon itself is not sweet, but if it's unripe, it's worse. Uh, but Contrast that with a honeycomb. A honeycomb is sweet. It's something you should love. Uh, and a bitter thing is should be something you should hate. But the passage here says that to the soul that is satisfied, the honeycomb is hated. It should love the honeycomb, but it doesn't love it. Honeycomb is hated. And to the soul that is hungry, the thing that is bitter becomes sweet. To it. It's like being offered to choose between a sweet, a sweet uh, ripe pineapple and an unripe pineapple. And our natural instinct will be to go for the sweet pineapple and not the unripe bitter pineapple. But the passage says uh, the opposite happens based on whether you are a satisfied soul or a hungry person. So I will just summarize uh, the, the proverb with two sentences. One is that self-satisfaction makes us see what is easy as hard. When a person is satisfied or self-satisfied, they hate the sweet thing. They hate the easy thing. They hate things that are good for them because of self-satisfaction. But when a person is hungry, they see what is hard as easy. They eat what is bitter and consider it sweet. So it, it just means that the state of a person's appetite would make them determine what is sweet and what is bitter, what they will embrace and what they will reject, what they want to do and what they would not want to do. When a person is hungry for something, even when it is hard and it is difficult, they are able to do it almost as if it is very easy. In the book of Genesis chapter 29, uh, the story is told about Jacob when he is going to marry and most of you are familiar with the story. He is told to work for seven years, 
for his wife and he thinks the wife is Rachel and he works for seven years and instead of Rachel he gets Leah and the father gives him a long rounded story about uh, giving their older daughter in marriage first so he says well if you still want Rachel then work another seven years for Rachel now you have to understand that Jacob is madly in love with Rachel and look at how the Bible describes how Jacob worked in Genesis 29 verse 18 to 20 it says now Jacob loved Rachel so he said I will serve you seven years for Rachel your younger daughter and Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. Now verse 20, very interesting. Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Seven years seemed like a, a few days. Now if you saw Jacob... And you said, this guy is suffering. This guy is going through difficulty. It is hard. Oh, what kind of mistreatment is that? Look at what his father-in-law has done. But Jacob was sinking his way through seven years. It was easy for him, not because the work was easy, but because of the hunger of his soul. He wanted that girl real bad. And he served seven years and never complain so what does that tell you that that when you love something and you're doing it with passion you don't complain about it because you have a hunger for it you have a desire for it you have intensity for it and you do it as if it's nothing but when you are doing something that you don't like and you 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 feel bad about then even a few days become seven years so really what changes the way we approach our work is not the work itself it's how we feel about the work and that gives us an idea of what we can do to become excellent people to become excellent people we're definitely going to be working but what will influence our work is whether we are satisfied souls or whether we are hungry souls. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. The Apostle Paul is literally giving us his philosophy of life. Paul who was not there when Jesus was ministering. Paul, who is a latecomer, overtakes the rest of the apostles, plants more churches than all of them, teaches more doctrine than all of them. He writes two-thirds of the New Testament, almost all the epistles in the New Testament. The doctrine of the New Testament is taught by Paul. How come a man who is a latecomer manages to become such an influential leader? Why was he not intimidated by the people he came to meet? Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, all these guys with very fanciful names. How come he's able to bypass all of them and become such a great influence? And Paul is telling us his philosophy his life philosophy, how he saw life, how he viewed life. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. And this is what Paul says. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Twice in this passage, the Apostle Paul uses the word press. Everybody say press. In verse 12, he says, I press on. In verse 14, he says, I press toward. Everybody say press. 
It's a very interesting word. It is out of the word press that we get our word pressure. Pressure is pressing. In both instances, in the lemma of the Greek, the word used is deoko. Deoko. And it means to press, to pursue, and interestingly, to persecute. To press, to pursue, to persecute. So when Paul says, I press on, he's saying almost, I persecute myself. The word used there means to suffer hardship under intense pressure. So when Paul says, I press on, he's not talking about something easy that he does. He's literally saying, I suffer hardship under intense pressure in order to move forward. I suffer hardship under intense pressure in order to move forward. Paul's Life was driven by pressure. In other words, Paul is saying, I persecute myself in order to move on. Pressure is a very powerful force. Without it, there is no movement. And those who hate pressure make very little movement in life. Because pressure moves us out of inertia. I wasn't a particularly good science student. I didn't like science. The part, the science subjects I liked was biology because it was easy to understand. The one I hated most was chemistry. Because it was just a confusing concept of things that change here and one, you borrow one atom there and add it to another atom and one molecule here. I said, why, why are they borrowing all these things? What, what's happening? But biology was easy, you know, to understand how the body functions. Physics was not uh, too bad because there was a practical aspect of it. And with all my lack of knowledge of science, I remember Newton's first law of motion. How many of you remember Newton's first law of motion? We, we had to memorize it uh, almost uh, by heart. And, and basically, it says that in a state of inertia, in a state of inertia, an object is going to remain in the same place or continue or remain in the same pace of velocity unless force is exerted on it. Is that not so? Yeah. Clap for me. This is a pure art student trying to think in science. So basically, what Newton's law of motion, now, now you know that motion has to do with movement. Newton is saying that in a state of inertia, in a state of nothing happening, a thing will remain where it is. Or if it is moving, it will move at the same pace. In, in front, you say, wah. He will move at the same pace. Unless pressure or force is applied. So when you see a person who is stuck in one place, a person moving, wah, you know that this person has refused pressure. Because if you're going to move, there has to be pressure. Everybody say pressure. Paul says, that is how I move. I press on. In the ancient world, the first concept of a press 
was the wine press. The wine press was what was used to produce wine. And what did the wine press do? The wine press would take grapes and they would create, they had a system that continued to apply pressure. And what the wine press would do is that it would squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze the grapes until water came out of it. They applied the same for the olive press to create olive oil. They squeezed the fruit. In fact, it was the same mechanism that was later uh, used by Gutenberg to make the printing press. That's why it was called the press, because it was pressing letters on paper. Press. Pressure. So, for you to move, my friend, you and I, we need pressure. If you hate pressure, you will be in one place or your movement will be one. So Paul says, I press on. And even when I have achieved something, I put myself under pressure to move again. Because movement is a product of pressure. And excellence is a product of pressure. Without pressure, you're going to remain where you are. Without pressure, you will never move. Life has within it what I call points of resistance. And without pressure, you can never move past them. One of the most precious objects or substances in our world is a diamond. Both in its raw state and in its polished state. Diamonds occur under extreme pressure of temperature and atmosphere, atmospheric pressure. Without pressure, diamonds cannot be produced. And diamonds are cut under extreme pressure. So for both for the making of the diamond and the polishing of the diamond, extreme pressure is required. If you hate pressure, your life will be stuck. If pressure makes you have headaches, you can't handle it, then you can't move. Excellence cannot occur in a state of inertia. So the question I want to ask you this morning is how well do you function under pressure? Do you run from responsibility when pressure increases? And do you fight those who apply pressure on you for you to perform? Many of the world's inventions were created under pressure. Nations and cultures that avoid pressure remain the same or move very slowly. I am convinced, without any shadow of doubt, I am convinced 100% that the critical problems of Africa are the effect of what I call cultural inertia. That is culture that is in one place and is resistant to change. Our economic problems are cultural problems. 
It is the culture that creates the problem. It is a people who are unwilling to allow pressure to move them. Even our religious problem, you know, when people complain about prophets and so on, it's not a Christian problem. It's a Ghanaian cultural problem. It's African traditional religion intruding into Christianity. It's not Christianity by itself. There is something about us that is resistant to change. And we make life easy for ourselves. But if you're going to excel, we must be like Jacob. We must accept pressure and work under it as if it's nothing. Whether you're a footballer or whatever you are, everybody requires pressure. Think of any industry or any vocation, even pastoring, without pressure, you do nothing. You will not achieve much. If, if, if your church is meeting in a small classroom and nobody puts pressure on them, they, in the classroom, the headmaster loves them and gives them all the access. Uh, they will like and they, they do decorate the classroom, paint it nice, but they will stay in a classroom. But the day they get pressure to move, they will build. I, I, I know we have doctors here and we respect what they are doing. But you know, in other countries, if there is a medical malpractice in a hospital, that hospital may be shut down. Here, you do surgery with somebody, leave scissors and all kinds of things in your stomach. And when it is fine, say, so, oh, we are sorry, we are sorry. They open you again and take it out as if nothing happened because nobody is going to sue you. Now, suing people is hard. It's painful. But when you are sued once, you will count the scissors after every surgery. If people die in our hospitals because of bad behavior and we hold ourselves accountable, then healthcare will improve. It's the same for pastors. If you go and counsel somebody and his marriage breaks up, and you are held accountable, you would think twice before you tell somebody that his marriage is because his mother-in-law is a witch. If you get sued for that statement, you will be very careful. But we go free. <laughs> In Ghana, we say, we say nonsense freely. We talk rubbish freely. Nobody is held to any account. And we think it's a good thing. It's not a good thing because there's no pressure. And because there's no pressure, there's no motion. Whether in law, in manufacturing, in entertainment, if people laugh at your unfunny jokes, you will never improve your jokes. Why do you think? Why do you think that our movie industry is not changing? You know, sometimes I watch Hollywood movies that were made in the 1930s or 1950s or 1960s. I mean, if you watch Judah Bernay or you watch uh, 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 Sound of Music made in the 60s or you watch uh, uh, even, even some of the old uh, what they call spaghetti westings, you know, with John Wayne and those, and you look at the structure of the movies, it's still way ahead of us now. Why? It's not because we are not good actors. It's not because they're not good directors, but we accept anything. No pressure. No problem. And if there's no problem, 
you are in the same place or you will be one. Now, normally when people put us under pressure, we hate them. But do you know that when you grow in life, the people you appreciate most are the ones who put you under pressure? The teachers you love most are those who drilled those physics laws into you and put you under pressure. The coach who put you under pressure. But the ones you loved in school who made you have your own way, later on you grow up and realize they were your worst enemies. But at a point they seem to be your best friends. Nobody likes pressure. I don't like it. You don't like it. But we have to embrace it in order to have motion. I'm not going to preach for long because we have communion and that's one of the effects of Sunday communion. It shortens the sermon. So I'm going to continue this next week. But let me say this. Pressure proves us. Pressure proves us. The real proof of a person is seen under pressure. It can either reveal the worst in us or the best in us. But for the purposes of my teaching, I'm going to look at the positive effects of pressure. Pressure proves us. How does it do that? Pressure shows what is within us. Pressure shows what is within us. Like a tea bag in hot water, pressure reveals what is hidden inside us. When you put a tea bag in hot water, it is under pressure for its flavors to be diffused. Without pressure, nobody benefits from what is within it. I'm yet to see anybody who takes a tea bag and puts it in their mouth. To, to eat or drink but hot water will bring the best out of your tea that hot water is pressure anyone who has dug a door a borehole for water experiences how pressure enables us to find water beneath dry earth I didn't know I would be a preacher or I could even speak publicly until I was put under pressure I'm naturally a very reserved person, very quiet, and nothing in me, in my natural state, shows that I can speak publicly. Nothing in my natural state. Until one day I went to a Christian fellowship and the leader, God bless him, put me under pressure and just announced publicly to everybody, next week Brother Mensah will share something with us and he's going to... And it's almost as if the whole earth opened. My whole world, as I knew, with the comfort, the security of just being an observer of other people and admirer of other people, all vanished. All of a sudden, I'm supposed to stand in front of people and tell them something. And what if I make a fool of myself? But it was that pressure that made me know for the first time in my life ever that I could speak. What if that man had not put me under pressure. In fact, that whole week before the meeting, I was praying. Either the rapture will come, or something, Lord, change this. But God never changed it. Thank God for prayers, he doesn't answer. And the week came, and I stood up to talk, and I shut my eyes and spoke and sat down and felt the most horrible in my life because I just felt, now everybody knows he's not just quiet, he's just foolish. That's why he's quiet. He has nothing to say. Look, I, I, all kinds of thoughts were going through my mind until after the meeting, people came to shake my hand. They said, we didn't know you could speak that well. We didn't know you could. And I said, wow, I didn't know myself. But what brought it out? Pressure. Pressure. Pressure strengthens what we have. Not only does it bring out what we have, it strengthens what we have. 
pressure on our muscles strengthens our muscles. Bodybuilders are huge with bulging muscles because of pressure they put on their muscles. Pressure is a, a builder. Without it, you cannot build your gifts, your talents for excellence. Pressure sharpens what we are doing. It sharpens you. It, it gives you a cutting edge. It refines gold. It sharpens knives. It helps us add value to our work. Without pressure, we'll satisfy ourselves with mediocre exploits and clap for ourselves. Be impressed with ourselves. Like we say in Ghana, we are the most hospitable people. You know, we, we just like to feel clap for ourselves. We are not hospitable, my friend. We are not hospitable one bit. We are not. Much of the hospitality is seeking for things. When we smile, we are smiling in anticipation. It's not that a person is nice and he's just smiling. No, he's smiling that you tip him. That's not hospitality. That's manipulation. If we were hospitable, why do we just treat each other so badly? You go to a shop, they are insulting. You go to the market, everybody is insulting. Is that hospitality? Please don't say we are the most hospitable people. No, we are not. We are not. We have to learn hospitality. It's not our culture, please. Whoever told us that is lying to us. Pressure stretches what we can do. It stretches what we can do. It enables us to turn something from one state to the other. Pressure changes water from liquid to gas. It blends foods, solid foods into liquid foods. Pressure stretches what you can do. Every one of us who wants to excel, how many of you want to excel this year? I pray God will give you pressure. I love this church. In some churches, people will say, I refuse it. But here you said, Amen. May God give you pressure. Amen. And next week, I'm going to talk about that. The pressure without and the pressure within. I'll be focusing on that. But all I can say is to excel, to accelerate, to gain motion, to move, to break resistance, your natural state will not do it for you. Your natural state is going to say, you are okay. Why are you worrying yourself? Why are you doing all of that? You know, in Ghana, when people see you joking, they say, ah, why are you worrying yourself? Are you going to compete in an uh, Olympics? No. Then, then why are you running every day? Because we want life to be cool. No problem. But for everything you want to achieve, and especially if you want to excel, Paul says, I put myself under intense pressure to do that. I press on. I press towards it. And this year, we are going to press. Somebody say, I'm going to press. Yes. And one of the things you're going to love is pressure. You will not insult people who do put you under pressure. You will not be angry with them. You will not hate them. You will embrace them and thank them for pressure because they are your best friends. For a moment, you may not see their value, but when they have purified the diamond in you and you are sparkling for the world to see, 
you go back and say, had this person not put this pressure on, them, on me, I would never have arrived at this point. And may the Lord help us, like Paul, to press on to the upward mark of Christ to be continued next week.